Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Screening, Brief Intervention and Referral to Treatment Overview and Relevance During COVID-19. My name is Jennifer Trujillo and I am the Substance Use Disorder and Special Populations Program Manager. Nevada Primary Care Association is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving access to high quality, community-based, affordable primary care in Nevada. We provide training and technical assistance to health centers and community partners to improve access to health care for all, especially for the uninsured and underinsured population. For more information, visit us at nbpca.org. This training is a partnership between Nevada Primary Care Association and the National Council for Behavioral Health. I just wanted to take a moment to thank them for helping us coordinate this session. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. During the presentation, please make sure to mute your phone or computer so we do not have feedback or background noise. Also, please be sure not to put your phone on hold or we will hear your hold music. You will have the opportunity to submit your questions to the presenters by typing your questions into the chat panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Questions will be collected and addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the, today's presentation. Today's session will be recorded and slides will be available to participants. I'm going to turn over the presentation to the National Council for Behavioral Health Trainers to introduce themselves and their background regarding SBIRT. Pam, please take it away. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Pam Petruszewski with the National Council for Behavioral Health, and I'm an integrated health consultant. Um, we're just going to put ourselves on Zoom video here briefly, just so you see who we are, and then we'll turn to the slides in a moment. I do a lot of expert training, a lot of motivational interviewing training. Um, I live in Minnesota and have been working with uh, the Nevada Primary Care Association now for quite a few months. It's been really fun. Aaron. Hello, sorry about that. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Williams with the National Council for Behavioral Health. Um, I am also an integrated care consultant here at the National Council, um, and I am currently located in Washington, D.C. And I've been doing uh, expert training and a lot of training related to substance use um, for probably about the last 17 years or so. Um, and, you know, like Pam, we've been working with the Nevada Primary Care Association for a few months, and we're really looking forward to engage with you all today. So thank you. Good, thanks. All right. So this is Aaron and I as well. You got to see us in real life quarantine and on the screen. Uh, so what we're here today to do is to talk a bit about what is SBIRT. And just for context sake, we are with the National Council for Behavioral Health, where we work with more than 3,000 member organizations, which are largely mental health centers, also federally qualified health centers, hospitals, a lot of different kinds of health systems in the context of supporting people with mental health and addictions. Um, so our big push is to get access and high quality care to people of those populations. And it's been great working with Nevada Primary Care Association so that we could um, help with expert implementation. So our plan for today is, um, I'm going to start us off and talk a bit about why SBIRT. And I hope as you're listening today, there are some talking points that you can take back when you're working with your organization around implementing this. I think we have to start with the why. And then we'll cover the SBIRT, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment, and then end um, with some ideas around how to have your organization best ready or prepared to support this. So I'm gonna start with talking a bit about why do people use alcohol and drugs? So why SBIRT needs to start with, why do we need to have some, a model like SBIRT? And it really comes down to a couple of things as concluded by Tom Fries, someone we've worked with quite a bit. You know, it, it's basically people are using substances either to feel good or to feel better. Um, it may start out as, you know, just a, a curiosity or an interest in relaxing or taking the edge off or whatever it may be. And for some people, it's uh, maybe a more intentional or even not intentional desire to 
not feel um, that creeping depression or to escape feelings of hopelessness or to relieve some anxiety. So generally people don't seek out to become addicted. Um, they are wanting to either just try something um, or to improve upon something that's been bothersome. That said, we also knew that today's webinar was not just ESPER, but why ESPER now uh, when we've got this pandemic on our hands? And uh, our CEO actually just wrote a paper and there are others I'm starting to see come up around this concern that there's gonna be a surge behind the curve. Um, and what we mean by that is, you know, because people are feeling very socially isolated, for some people, they don't have the structure in their day they used to have if they're out of a job or they're trying to teach kids uh, from home. Um, they have, you know, maybe unstable housing, economic distress. That is leading to an increase in substance use, not to mention depression and anxiety, like my last slide showed. Um, for some people, they're turning to substances to lessen those feelings of depression and anxiety. So we're really concerned that there's going to be an increased amount of use. Um, for some people, it's getting harder to acquire the substances they were using. So they may be um, finding themselves in withdrawal or they can't get their substance of choice. And so they're using something else that uh, maybe is even riskier. There's also, you know, we're starting to see places open up, but there's also still some reduced access to emergency care. There's a lot of people afraid to go into an emergency room because they don't want to get COVID. So they may need emergency help but not getting it. Um, and certainly we know that the use of substances compromises our immune system. Um, alcohol, opioids, a lot of different substances are hard on our lungs, vaping, um, and can cause other health complications. And um, as we all know, you know, people with other pre-existing conditions are more susceptible to COVID-19. So I guess what we could argue is maybe now is the time more than ever before to work with us. So a couple other things I want to mention, um, you know, the sale of alcohol has gone way up <laughs> depending on what market you, know, you look at. But, you know, this says online sales, according to the Nielsen research firm, said they were up 243%. I know I'm certainly seeing it on social media, you know, lots of new cocktail recipes or, you know, funny memes about you know, quarantining and making a quarantini. So alcohol is um, increasingly being used more than ever before. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, they have a crisis helpline that had more than 300% increase in use compared to a year earlier. Um, actually, compared to a year earlier, eight more than 800% increased use. Uh, so certainly people are feeling a lot of mental health crisis at the same time. And then we have a stat here on the history of methamphetamine specifically can cause damage. Um, and, you know, just more reason why this is going to become the next surge. And it already was, right? We already had a really big crisis on our hands with mental health and substance use services um, not being funded at the level of other types of care and the stigma and reasons for people not to get what they needed. And now we have a pandemic on top of it. So all the more reason um, we gotta be ready for this. And then just one more thing I'll, I'll mention at this point that you know we don't have a lot of data on what does mass stress do to us and what are the impacts of substance use. Uh, but there was a series of articles written after 9-11. And what they found was that the intensity of exposure to 9-11 trauma actually was associated with binge drinking even five to six years later. So, I mean, I know I'm in a mindset right now of taking this day by day. And this article helps me remember it, it is day by day. How do we do the work we're doing? And also, we got to be in this for the long haul because this isn't, you know, people aren't going to just feel immediately better if they can go to a restaurant or, you know, there's a lot of long term effects. Um, and in the case of 9 11, you know, up to five to six years later, there was an increased rate of binge drinking relative to people's exposure to 9 11. 
So this, this slide has been around a lot longer than even the pandemic. It is a reminder now though that substance use disorders are in and of themselves a health issue. We are at increased risk for a lot of health complications and have worse outcomes. We are high risk users of substances, drugs and alcohol. Um, it also increases the likelihood that we will engage in riskier behaviors and uh, we're not as adherent to our treatment when our um, world is consumed by substance use. So these are some reasons to say, okay, this is the world now of primary care. You know, we're in the business of medical care for the most part, and this is how there is a connection with substance use. I often liken the idea of prevention and early intervention of substance use to what we do already with things like blood pressure screening, right? It is absolutely a common vital sign. It's something I expect to get every time I go into my doctor's office, they're gonna take my blood pressure. Why do they take it every time I come in? Because we know that if we just waited until someone has a heart attack to finally take their blood pressure, it's too late, right? So we need to know early and often what a person's blood pressure um, is, is doing. If it starts to creep up into a more dangerous zone, we take action on that. If someone's maintaining a healthy blood pressure, we wanna reinforce that. Similarly, we don't wait until someone has cancer, ideally, to be doing some of these um, detection screenings that we know can make a difference. There's a, obviously a huge push for mammograms to be done regularly because we don't wanna wait until someone has breast cancer to know. Um, so it's the same concept really in substance use that we want to make this a routine part of care. The recommendation is at least once a year, we are asking people about their substance use. So we aren't waiting until there is a crisis, until someone has a full on substance use disorder to have early conversations about the link with health um, and have people make lifestyle changes and other things that they can do to mitigate the negative effects, just like we do um, to mitigate the negative effects of heart disease or cancer by doing early and frequent regular screening. And then just a couple other things before I turn it to Erin. Um, this is another thing that may help with the why expert with um, primary care staff. You know, there's a lot of different preventive services that we are asked to do in primary care. This is just a handful of them, but these are the ones that rank highest in terms of clinically preventable burden of the associated diseases and those things that are relatively cost-effective. And so what um, Mike Machusik is a researcher actually here in Minnesota, and um, he and some other colleagues did this analysis of taking all the possible preventive services, and there's more than 60 things that have to be on your mind if someone gets an annual exam or they turn 50 or whatever other markers. And this analysis then looked at what are those top three things that basically could give us the best bang for our buck. So number one, immunizations and tobacco screening. We know what an impact that makes on population health, right? We have come a long way in our country around immunizing kids and we've eradicated a lot of really terrible diseases because of having strong immunizations. Every new mom knows that they are gonna be asked um, to look over brochures on different vaccinations and they know that there's gonna be a schedule uh, encouraged for them to immunize their kids. Similarly, tob tobacco, we've come a long way in our country um, on the rates of tobacco. I believe it's only like 13% right now, the US population uses tobacco. And as a result, we've had an increase in longevity. We've had a decrease in a lot of illnesses associated with tobacco use. Interestingly, alcohol screening and brief intervention in adults is ranked really high on this list. Again, I'm only showing you what fell into the top three. And it turns out alcohol is actually even higher ranked than blood pressure. Um, you don't even see mammograms on this list. I think it comes in at number four. So we could do a lot if we implemented screening and brief intervention for alcohol. We could 
uh, manage a lot of other clinically um, clinical burdens, um, and it's relatively cost effective. So I put that out there in terms of thinking about priorities and how to prioritize this. It's to say, you know, if we did this, it could make a big difference. Uh, so uh, where we'll take this now is to really dive into these elements of SBIRT. SBIRT is a really a public health model. If you think of what I had earlier around, you know, routine screening, routine conversations, building this into the course of regular services because of the impact it can have. Um, and then the SBIRT is what we'll start to cover next. So Aaron, I will advance the next handful of slides for you and turn it to you to talk about screening. All right, thank you, Pam. Um, and I just wanna you know, try to extend on some of Pam's comments um, about the importance of SBIRT, um, you know, given you know, our current um, you know, situation. Um, certainly um, it was always, and I think Pam gave some great evidence you know, from a public health standpoint um, to you know, do these kinds of screenings um, and given that increased need and increased risk um, coming out of this, it'll be you know, even more important to think about how you can begin to um, routinely ask questions about um, you know, alcohol and substance use as a part of your um, work in primary care. So the slides you have in front of you um, is really just kind of a basic expert screening process. Um, so you take a screening tool, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and someone screens um, in no use, you really just want to engage what we call, um, you know, reinforcing those healthy choices. Um, if they're engaged in moderate use, you would then move into what we would call the, the brief intervention portion of this, um, where you would talk to them a little more about, um, you know, uh, about their substance use, and then, you know, begin helping them work on plans to either cut back or discontinue. Um, if someone screens in the high use group, um, that really means that these are someone who is in need of um, you know, a high level of services um, you know, you know, pretty immediately. And um, you want to engage them in some sort of a brief intervention, but very often that's going to be with an eye towards referring them to uh, more uh, advanced services. And of course, with all of the folks who screen positive, whether it's moderate or high, you want to make sure that you're able to follow up in a routine way, whether it's to, you know, check on whatever their plan was to cut back or cut down, or whether it is to check on, you know, how things went with the referral to, um, you know, other parts of care. Uh, next slide. Okay, so back in, um, I think it was about 2018 or so, um, you know, the National Council, again, we've been doing expert work for, for quite a while now. Um, so we were looking kind of across the landscape and trying to figure out, you know, how we could do more to help you know, um, standardize or really co coalesce some of the best thinking around uh, expert. And we ended up bringing in a number of expert, um, um, you know, experts in the field together uh, for all day meeting and really talking to them about what would be the most um, effective way really to put together an expert screening model, excuse me, expert model, and really then think about what, um, you know, healthcare is going to need going forward. Um, and ultimately, where we ended up is with the document that you see up on our screen on your screen. Um, it's on our website. You can download it at that web address that's listed um, at no cost. It's really there for the public. And what it does is really talks about sort of a blueprint of how you can more effectively do expert in primary care. Um, what it also talks about is a way, to, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation, of how to think about. Um, utilizing your resources internally, uh, particularly if you're in a rural area or someplace where there are not a lot of uh, treatment options for those that might need a referral to treatment, and really begin thinking about how you can do um, some work to address some substance use internally. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, you know, later on. But this is a really good document, a uh, document that really kind of, uh, we think, sort of coalesces uh, gives good um, detail in terms of how you can um, put together an effective expert process. Uh, next slide. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about screening. Um, and really, in terms of screening, um, you know, we um, are, are essentially recommending that you know all adults be screened at least annually um, for unhealthy alcohol and drug use. Um, you know, really as as a part of just really population based prevention and treatment. Um, again, you think about the COVID nineteen and some of the data that Pam presented earlier. Um, you know, given some of the um, you know physiological damage and some of the stressors that are really impacting the entire country um, currently, um, it just becomes more important to really check in on alcohol and drug use. Um, you know, pretty routinely going forward. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'm going to stop here for just a second and just kind of to get a sense of where you all are and sort of what kinds of programs you all are implementing. And then hopefully, you know, in the chat and in some of the questions later on, we can talk a little bit about this. Um, get a sense of where you are in terms of just screening and sort of what you're doing. Um, so one of the things we wanted to know is, are you currently using the PHQ-9, uh, which is the screening tool for depression? Um, have you successfully implemented that in your program? Um, so we have yes or no. Um, we'll give you a second for you guys to, you know, take that poll. All right. And so, OK, so we have um, well more than half of you all are have implemented the PHQ-9 um, and others. Um, looks like they have not as of yet. Um, and part of the reason we're asking about the PHQ-9 is because um, if you have implemented that, implementing the ESPER protocol for alcohol and other drugs, um, can work in tandem with that PHQ-9 um, screening that you're already doing. It may be a helpful addition um, you know, to the PHQ-9 or if you're using other screening tools um, for um, mental health, such as like the GAD-7 or something for anxiety. Um, this will really make a lot of that work far more comprehensive. All right, next slide. Okay. So why are we talking about screening and why are we making this recommendation really for at least annual screening? Right. Um, one, um, you know, you know, kind of, you know, given what Pam talked about earlier, you know, unhealthy substance use is pretty common. Um, you know, it changes over time. Um, you know, really, you know, what someone is doing at, you know, 20 years old or 21 years old related to substance use um, may not be what they're doing at 50 years old. Um, and it has an impact on overall health. So uh, routinely checking in will give you some sense of, you know, where someone is in terms of their substance use, you know, whether they are, you know, um, you know, using substances, you know, not using substances at all, you know, only minimally using or whether there may be, you know, signs of a particular problem or, they, or if they're using, um, you know, more than they should be based on some underlying health condition. Um, screening for alcohol use is one of the highest prevention priorities recommended. Um, you know, Pam put that sort of data up there. And, you know, just to kind of, um, you know, make it very succinct, um, you know, you know, reducing uh, alcohol use and, you know, getting folks to, to quit smoking are still kind of the two biggest things you can do from a public health standpoint in terms of your know, biggest bang um, for your buck and in terms of improving long term health. Um, really getting those drinking levels down and getting people to quit smoking are really the still the, the big ones in terms of public health benefit. Um, you know, screening also does open up a dialogue about, um, you know, symptoms, other things that um, you know, have an impact on the person's life. It really, you know, provides, you know, provides the comprehensive picture um, by adding in these screening tools of what may be happening and gives them, a, um, you know, more window into what might be appropriate in terms of you know, treatment approaches that they may recommend, whether it's for the substance use itself or for some underlying condition um, that may be impacted by it. Again, knowing about use is critical to ethical, high quality care. Again, um, you know, really just um, having that information allows you the ability to a craft more effective um, treatment protocols um, and really helps you and to make sure that the things that you're doing are effective and not harmful as well. Um, next slide. All right. So here there are a number of screening tools out there. Um, the important thing about the ESPER um, protocol is that you use an evidence based screening tool. Um, and there are a, a ton of them out there. So I would encourage folks uh, to not reinvent the wheel um, if they're looking for a screening tool. Um, here I've just listed a few of them. They're really um, a, a dozens more out there. Um, the audit, which is the first one there, which is a screening tool. 
um, you know, very good screening tool for alcohol. The DAST is sort of its drug use counterpart. Um, the ASSIST is a World Health, Health Organization screening tool that um, screens for tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. Um, the CRAFT is one of the um, you know, more well, um, well-known uh, screening tools for adolescent substance use. Um, the S2BI is another um, well-known, uh, well-respected screening tool for uh, adolescent uh, substance use as well. Um, certainly, most people here are familiar with the PHQ-9 for depression. Um, the tweak slash T8 is a screening tool for substance use among, um, you know, pregnant and, um, um, and women of childbearing age. So, um, a helpful tool there if you're working with, um, you know, um, with that population. And then we have the audit C plus two, which I'll talk about in just a second, which is, um, another screening tool for, um, alcohol use. Um, so, so here you have it up on the screen, which is the audit C plus two. Um, the Audit C really is kind of a brief, short screen, which is really comprised of the first three questions of that audit screening tool that I talked about um, a second ago on the other slide. Um, so those first three questions, which talk about how often did you have a drink containing alcohol? How many drinks did you have? Do you have in a typical day? And how often do you have five or more drinks uh, on one occasion? Um, this really wants, it really allows you to get a sense of quantity and frequency of alcohol use, um, which are the important things that you need to know um, to really understand someone's um, drinking. You know, we recommend that you talk about this over the past three months, which allows you to do really good follow up and monitoring um, by saying it that way. And um, our recommendation is that you, you know, add, um, you know, these two questions, which are one question on marijuana um, and another question about have you used illegal drugs or prescription drugs for non-medical reasons. Um, you know, this is a, a fairly quick screening tool, um, which is a high uh, degree of um, um, efficacy and really allows you to get a, some sense of where a person is in terms of substance use, and then you can chart a course um, from here based on the results, um, you know, so you can figure out sort of what you need to do next. Uh, next slide. All right, so here is essentially how you would score the Audit C plus two. Um, so the green at top, the Audit C questions, um, a, um, you know, a negative screen on the Audit C would be um, you know, women with a score below three, men with a score below four, and uh, zero to one on the cannabis question and zero on the drug question. Um, if someone screens positive, they would be between the three and the six on the, um, uh, women would be between the three and the six on the uh, audit C portion of, of the tool, and men would be between four and six on the audit C portion of the tool. Um, they will be between two and three on the cannabis screen. Um, and someone who has a high positive would be um, any numbers above seven on the audit tool um, and also a screen, a, a screening number of four on the cannabis question, as well as any numbers between one and four on the other drug question. Um, and then a high positive is essentially where you would need to begin thinking about referring folks to um, you know, other forms of, of, of treatment. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'm going to stop here and uh, Pam is going to talk about the brief intervention. Yep. Thanks. And then after we do brief intervention, we'll pause because we want to see if there are questions so far and then we'll pick it up from there. So just a heads up. Um, the brief intervention is is not meant to be anything super elaborate or fancy or, you know, it's really a conversation with the patient. You may call it brief counseling, brief intervention, but it's a conversation um, for anybody who does score in that positive range, unhealthy use. And um, it's the opportunity to take that moment that you have when they've just reported use that's in a risky range to connect just like we would if someone's blood pressure was starting to creep up. We wouldn't just shrug our shoulders and do nothing. <laughs> We'd ask them about their diet. We'd check in on any medication they might be taking. So similarly, we want to in, invest in the opportunity to have a brief conversation. Uh, what you would do in this 
section. And again, think about this like what you do with other things. It's having a conversation that is based on rapport building, um, providing feedback on the result. If my blood pressure is now higher than it used to be, I expect that my provider and care team is gonna say, hey, your blood pressure's gone up from this to this. So we would show the results. We'd talk about what that score means on the audit C plus two. Then provide your information or clinical advice and then support the person in making a plan. So I'll just briefly show what that can look like. Stage of conversation and rapport might be to ask a few more questions. You know, tell me more about what you tend to use and who are you with when you're using, or how does this fit into your life? What concerns, if any, do you have about your use? So just building some rapport and asking a few more questions, getting to know them. Feedback can be simple things, simple statements like, um, so you've told me, thanks for letting me know that, you know, marijuana, you feel like it helps you relax. I am concerned it might be contributing to your asthma. If you can make a link to anything physical that they're there for or that they already have um, on their chart, or even just say, you know, we don't know for sure if there's a connection between these two, but it's possible or we know that substances can affect your health, your physical health. And then certainly not just putting that out there and that's the end of it. It's, you know, another draw, uh, drawing out the other person. So what do you think about that? Um, because if the other person can say, gosh, I didn't know that, that is now reinforcing to them that they're gonna kind of take it in and think about it. Providing some clinical recommendations might be sharing what we know about Healthy drink limits, the NIAAA has some good information out there about the number of drinks and the uh, frequency of drinks, and then what is a standard drink. So NIAAA is a good resource for that. Um, and then really just kind of checking in about ways to minimize their health risks. Maybe your recommendation is, you know, that they um, not drink for a period of time while you assess whether that's contributing to migraines. Um, it might be, you know, asking them if they were to cut back, could you um, revisit that and see if their lung capacity is better, right? It's something that is starting to, again, build that connection with their physical health. And then ultimately supporting their plan. So keep in mind that people are more likely to make the changes uh, that we are proposing if they feel like they have the ability to contribute to what those changes could be um, and build on them. So ask the patient, what do you think is reasonable? It may not be where you ultimately want them to be. Maybe you would recommend, and you can say this, I recommend you stop using this particular substance, but then follow it with something like, and what do you think is realistic right now? Because all of this is about building their confidence that they can make small changes, which will help them build those changes into things that are even more insignificant. Um, whatever thing they're willing to do or try, this is where follow up comes in, right? To say, you know, that's great. And, you know, when we get you back here for your flu shot in September, I'd like to revisit this and see how you're doing. Something that shows we're going to keep this on the radar, just like we do with blood pressure. We don't take their blood pressure once and then never revisit it. We do it again and again. And so how do we make this just a routine, matter of fact, uh, you know, something that we revisit because we know behavior change doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen with one conversation. It's something we build on. So one more thought on BI. I just put it all together for you if you really have a sh very short amount of time. You could say, first of all, thanks for filling out our screening questionnaire. Tell me more about your use. Then maybe they tell you about how much they're drinking and how often. And you could say, you know, I am concerned because we know that drinking more than four in a day and 14 in a week for men, uh, that could be affecting your blood pressure. Incidentally, so you know, it's um, drinking more than three a day for women and seven per week is at a higher risk range. So it's different for men and women. The NIAAA has resources on that. So you put out a concern, right? Or you put out some feedback or statement about the connection to health, and then you end on a question of, so what do you think? Or what might be your next step? 
I think the more we give people the space to respond to that, the more they're going to be willing to do that next step because they've they've contributed to the solution. So there's a lot more that can go into BI, but I just wanted to give you a little flavor for what that can look like. And I promise we would pause to see if there are questions on anything we discussed so far. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you, or you can type it into our chat box. We do have one question. How do you feel about using a pre-screen option first? One question and then follow up with audit that screening. Yeah, Aaron, do you want to take that? Yeah, so I can um, take that question while I sort of get. Um, oh, I forgot um, you're doing that. <laughs> do you want me to yeah. take it? <laughs> sure, if you want to while I'm <laughs> pulling Good up the technology uh, going to. Right, exactly. Yes. We absolutely recommend that. I think it depends on your setting. Some places feel like if they're going to use ultimately the full audit or the full DAST, they would start with something shorter, like the audit C. In fact, the audit C plus two that Aaron showed is that kind of brief screen. Probably not everybody needs a full 10 or more item questionnaire when they're just walking in because they have a sore throat, right? So for a routine, what we call universal screening, everybody once a year, do start with something brief. And if that's positive, you can move on to something else. It's similar, since many of you are using the PHQ-9, it's similar to some health centers use the PHQ-2, which is just the first two questions as their initial casting of the net. And then if that's positive, they move on to the nine. The reason not to and to potentially use a full one right off the bat is if you have, if pretty much everybody is scoring positive on your brief screen, it's probably worth starting not with a brief and using the full. But generally in health centers, starting with a brief one is recommended. All right, so if there are questions, feel free to type them into the chat box um, and we can um, get to them once we get towards the end here. So, um, you know, the last aspect of Esper that we wanted to talk about um, is referral to treatment. Um, so the vast majority of people who you screen are probably going to screen in either the negative range or in the um, sort of moderate or so range and probably aren't going to need this service. Um, however, um, people who do screen in the high positive range um, and need referral to treatment are really probably, you know, at the sort of sort of tip of the scale in terms of needing um, more robust substance use treatment services. So. Um, the um, screening tools that we use here map pretty well to the DSM, um, and um, they're likely going to need some additional services. And we'll talk about um, kind of what you can do in terms of interim steps here um, to move forward. But what? Um, but in terms of referral to treatment, what we're talking about um, is services really beyond sort of what may be in most primary care settings, uh, whether that is a full-on addiction treatment program you know, some, um, you know, more robust counseling, CBT, MET, motivational interviewing, um, some sort of, you know, peer support programs, um, and also potentially use of medications. Um, certainly um, before this pandemic, um, we had an epidemic of, you know, opioid use disorder. So the use of medications is really kind of the frontline treatment there. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, you know, what that means um, in terms of what you can potentially do internally as your own organization. Uh, next slide. All right. So, um, again, in that document that we referenced earlier, um, you know, essentially the toolkit that talks about some of these procedures, um, one of the things, if someone screens in the high positive um, range, um, what we recommend is um, an additional step of you know doing this, which is really a um, essentially sort of a symptom screen, um, and this talks about um, alcohol symptoms as well as other drug symptoms, um, and this really maps you know directly to the DSM diagnostic criteria. So this gives you a um, you know really good sense of you know where someone is um, in terms of their trajectory around substance use and may really give you enough um, some other information in terms of how you want to proceed um, going forward um, there is some um, uh, very limited data now but um, you know it's it's um, beginning to emerge in terms of brief screening and brief intervention 
um, you know, that people who likely are you know, screening positive, particularly for drug use, um, you know, may need more um, direct additional services that the brief interventions may um, have only limited impact. Um, but you may want to really consider, you know, doing um, some other work internally, um, such as use of medications and other things, particularly for people with opioid use disorder. Um, so you really want to think about that as you begin to kind of set your services up. Um, so for people who are screening in the high positive range, um, you really want to you know, talk to them more about their problem, maybe use um, this symptom checklist to get some of that information, um, as well as talking to them about um, potentially going to some higher form of care. Uh, next slide. All right, so for people who um, you know, are um, screening high positive and have essentially opioid use disorder or uh, more um, you know, significant uh, drug substance use disorder, um, you know, again, the medications are some of the frontline treatment. And part of what, um, you know, when we got those um, experts together back in 2018, one of the things they wanted to make a recommendation about, and they did in the document, was that, um, you know, people, particularly with opioid use disorder, um, there may be some health centers that actually have some capacity to begin doing some of that um, you know, beginning that treatment, um, you know, within their own, uh, inside their own walls. So um, thinking about, um, you know, getting people onto initial doses of uh, buprenorphine or, or other uh, medications for substance use um, as a way to help stabilize the person and then, you know, enrolling them in, in counseling support services or peer support services as well. But, um, you know, very often many health centers um, you know, and other um, health facilities may have some ability to do this. So if you do, uh, we recommend that as a part of your um, sort of referral to treatment um, next steps. Um, next slide. And so then, so I just showed the medications that are currently FDA approved for opioid use disorder. Um, these are the medications that are FDA approved for alcohol use disorder. Again, um, if you are beginning to use or think about medications as a part of your health center's work, um, you know, we recommend that you think about using all of them, including the um, alcohol medications as well as the even smoking cessation medications um, as a part of your work. Um, people who are um, screening at high positive could potentially benefit from some of these um, medications and they are across the board being underutilized. So, you know, begin thinking about, um, you know, how you can orient your services so people who come in and screen positive uh, who may need these services can get them in a streamlined um, sort of way. Uh, next slide. All right, so we'll stop here and just do a bit of a, a poll question just to get a sense of you know, where you all are in terms of uh, medication assisted treatment services. Um, so the question here is, do you offer MAT services? Uh, we have three options. Um, yes, you do offer them on site. Uh, yes, you offer them, but through a referral provider. And no, we don't offer MAT services. All right, so let me see what we have here. Okay, so about half of you, right at half, um, have um, you know, have it and have it on site. Um, another third or so say they do it, but through a referral. Um, and then uh, about 16% say that you don't have it yet or um, you're not offering those services just yet. Um, so, so again, it, it, that's actually really good because you know if you have um, you know a good expert protocol in place, um, you know this might be a way for you to really think about how you can enhance um, the services you're providing to your or to your um, you know patients um, and really move them in a very streamlined way if they screen positive you know into some of those services. Um, really to help stabilize them and potentially um, get them on the road to recovery, um, you know, if they're um, you know, really having, struggling with substance use disorder. Uh, next slide. All right, so here, um, this is just, uh, a, you know, as a, as a supplement to um, you know, kind of what Pam was talking about with the, uh, you know, brief intervention. You know, this is really some conversation um, that your um, team can have to help expedite, you know, the referral process. Um, you know, very often after you, the, um, you know, provider has made some recommendations related to the screening, um, it, we sort of encourage the idea of really a warm handoff, um, whether that's to your behavioral health staff or, or other staff person. 
um, you know, really bringing them in to talk more specifically about, you know, what may be um, happening as it relates to the substance use, um, you know, problem and really looking to work with that person um, to get you, uh, whether it's a, a full on brief intervention or some other, um, you know, referral to appropriate sources of care. So this is just a way of thinking about it, um, you know, a way to kind of talk about it. You know, at the top of it, we talk about, you know, have a team member who can be very helpful in finding options that may work for you. Um, he or she's right next door. Let me go get them. Um, so really just thinking about um, how you can do what we call a warm handoff. Um, the better you do this, the more likely the person is, you know, to go to those treatment referrals, whether it's internally to, um, you know, the MAT clinic or some other place or externally to another um, provider. Um, so really the better you can do that and the better you can you know, um, really introduce or usher that person into the room to talk about these um, concerns, the, the better and the more likely um, you are to, um, you know, people are to get to those services. Uh, next slide. And Aaron, if it's okay, yeah. I'm gonna, just yep. uh, the, the two questions that came in, this is probably a good point to, to okay speak to them one is about yep. how do you prepare providers especially from a harm reduction perspective and so i think this is a slide to to remind us that this isn't all on the provider's shoulders to do mm -hmm. so one way to get them bought into doing this is to say it's going to take a team it's not all for you to screen and do a brief intervention and refer you know it's who on our team is going to do the screening and then how do they prep the results so the provider gets them if it is a higher risk person. Um, we do want primary providers to be involved to say Absolutely. something and to engage mm -hmm. the patient in some conversation uh, because they have so much influence, but it isn't all on them. So it's, right. if you have on-site behavioral health, become that primary provider's best friend. Say, yeah, I want to be a part of this and find out their pain points. It's usually things like yeah, I've got so many people with uncontrolled diabetes, or I'm also supposed to, I'm getting dinged if I don't, you know, talk about tobacco cessation. Any other physical health issues are usually a big pressure point for them. So show how you can help with that, how that handoff can be done so that substance use can be one more piece of this with the help of the team. And then yeah, the I, question, I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I think, um, you know, the more you can demonstrate, um, you know, Pam, as you talked about that, that you know, there's a team sort of working with with providers. So it's not all on them. And also that there's a clear delineated protocol. Right. So um, that's something that they don't have to think about too much in terms of what happens. You know, what happens next? What am I supposed to do in this situation? Um, you know, the more you can kind of you know, make that pretty streamlined, the easy and more efficient, um, you know, that can be because, you know, um, often PC uh, providers are, are managing, you know, multiple clients and patients in a short period of time, so. Yeah, thank you. And then the other question was about uh, expert using telehealth. And mm -hmm. so this slide is a thought too, that, you know, you can't always do warm handoffs right now. We can't walk people down the hall if we're not seeing everybody in person. So you can. Um, I'm working with some health centers that are doing the screening, either sending it through the person's patient portal or the, um, you know, there's a, a nurse calling the patient first to say, hey, I know we're gonna set you up with a televisit with the doc. I've got some you know, history to gather. They mm -hmm. could do the screening verbally. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And then there can be this, you know, provider saying, um, thanks for doing this televideo visit. And, you know, I think it'd be really great if I could set you up to talk to our behavioral health. So it can be done. It's different, right. of course. Uh, but Aaron, anything to add to that? And then I'll advance the slides for you. Yeah, no, it's just that, um, you know, I think, you know, we're all sort of in this, um, you know, brave new world, um, you know, with, you know, telehealth, a number of health centers I've talked to as well are, are moving in this direction. Um, it certainly can be done. Um, you know, similar to, to what Pam experienced, um, I've seen some people have it so that even if they're doing like video conference, like the MA will come on first before the provider and will do just the same sort of routine that they would go through before, um, just doing it, um, you know, online and then the provider gets on. Um, so, so it can be done, and I think health centers and, and other entities are beginning to just figure that out. 
um, you know, and, and I think over time, you know, that process will continue to be refined. All right. So here, um, you know, you know, what if the person doesn't want a referral? Right. So so this is something that you may encounter um, very often. Um, you know, you're going to have clients that come into um, the clinic and this is the first time that they really have ever had um, a professional talk with them about um, their substance use. Um, they may be a bit resistant to attending some sort of referral. Um, you know, um, don't worry, um, you know, don't do any, don't do, do nothing. Um, what you may have to do is engage them in additional brief counseling or additional brief interventions really designed to work through, um, you know, what may be um, a barrier to them actually going to the referral. Um, you know, sometimes you may have to see them a couple of times, you know, just to get them to really think through the referral. Um, again, the more streamlined and the more comfortable you can make someone, you know, as they think about the referral, um, the better off you be, you'll be. But there may be occasions where you will have to have them come back in um, for another visit um, and just to kind of talk to you more about and work through some of those barriers um, that they may have. Um, with um, you know taking referral, um, I just want to I'll just mention this in the um, case of of adolescents. Um, there very often may be some cases where uh, you are you know trying to you know really engage the parents or guardians um, um, or or some or the adolescents loved ones in you know allowing a referral to happen or for them to take a referral to, to other treatment services. So um, there may be. Um, some some work that you need to do there as a part of your brief interventions or brief counseling. Um, next slide. All right. So one of the things we want to do, um, if you're going to engage in this work, we certainly want you to take any data that comes out of the screening process, any data you can get from, you know, what you're tracking related to the brief intervention, and we want you to to use it. Right. So you want to you know follow up. Um, you want to monitor um, at least quarterly. Um, you want to see are people getting better? Um, are people making their visits? Um, are they benefiting from the services being being offered? Do we need to change or tweak anything? You know what's happening? Um, you know one of our colleagues at National Council talks about this idea of you know things that get measured get changed. And so if you really want this to work, you really want this to to stick. You're going to have to um, you know measure all of these components. Um, you know, really, um, you know, use that data, you know, reflect it back to your providers and your MAs and other parts of the, of, of the staff that, that may be able to use it or, or benefit from it. And then also, you know, use that data to make changes. Um, it could be, you know, that you're finding that most of the people come in, you have a high percentage of people who come in that screen positive for marijuana. So maybe you want to think about, you know, what are your prevention options or what is your educational op option related to marijuana use um, or people screen positive for alcohol. And that you may want to you know, engage in a very different process for that. Um, or you have a high number of people who need um, opioid use disorder treatment and, you know, are referred for medication assisted treatment. Um, but you won't know that unless you're, you know, collecting the data and looking at it. So this is really just a plug to make sure that you are um, monitoring this and monitoring this, um, you know, quarterly um, is our recommendation. Uh, next slide. Next slide, Susan. All right. So, you know, implementing this does involve change, a change at the organizational level. Um, and you really want to make sure that you have you know, solid leadership buy in to really set the stage and the foundation for this. Right. You know, this is a priority. I think we've you know, given you a lot of information here to suggest that it is it's something that should be you know, very much implemented as a part of your services. Um, and we really um, think that, you know, you should engage in this. But you want to have leadership that is, it is bought in. You certainly want to identify some champions. Um, provide some time and resources to support it. And then again, set those expectations. You know, things that get measured get changed. So you really want to, you know, use the data to begin setting some of those expectations. Uh, next slide. All right. So I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this since we don't have a lot of time left. Um, but again, expert really 
um, you know, you know, using this process, you can um, you know, replace less effective screenings. Um, it really helps people think about the continuum of substance use. Um, and in our view, it improves overall care and really helps your organization um, you know, with other changes that may come through. Uh, next slide. All right, these are a few resources that are available for folks um, related to this. Um, Pam talked about some of the NIAAA stuff and also um, you know, our, our resources on the National Council's website, you know, our um, implementing care for alcohol and drug use in medical settings, extension of expert, um, as well as other really good um, resources and tools. Next slide. All right, thank you all. And I guess we have a few questions here that we probably want to see if we can get to. So I'll yeah. um, stop here. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I answered a few in the text chat box that were easier to quickly respond. I think there was a really thoughtful question about, you know, we're already, we are expected to do depression screening. And so that's 12 and older. And what is the thinking on SBIRT and ages? And, you know, certainly age 18 and up, people should be mm -hmm. screened once a year, all adults. Um, if you are able to screen adolescents, that's also uh, very important. So 13 and up, some places will start younger than that, but you know, as Aaron said earlier, a, you know, 14 year old may say they're not using at all, but they are going to be 18 and they're going to be 20 and they're going to be 40. And so how do we do this early and often? So it isn't a shock when we are asking an adult because we've been asking them ever since they were an adolescent. So really it's recommended 13 and up, but different tools, different process, confidentiality, all of that has to come into play with adolescents. Thank you, Pam and Erin, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have further questions, please contact myself, Jennifer, at J-T-R-U-J-I-L-L-O at nbpca.org. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you complete that survey and provide your feedback. On behalf of the Nevada Primary Care Association, Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Uh, thank you all. Thank you.